Good morning. Blessed Sabbath to everyone here. Uh, those that are able, I'd just like to say another word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to come together and fellowship on this, your holy Sabbath day. We now invite your presence, the presence of the holy angels and the Holy Spirit. Please give me the words that I may speak only yours. And let me humble myself before the cross of Christ, Lord, and I pray and ask for your special blessing on this congregation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As you can see, the message today is called The Only Safe Course. I don't know if you can read the sign there. It says, danger, people have been seriously hurt or killed in this area. Extreme caution should be observed at all times. You know, as I prayed about the message that I wanted to give today, uh, my mind was taken back to a story that I read not long ago. And it's about a young man that became popular in his country for doing death-defying stunts from high-rise skyscrapers. He climbed these buildings that were many, many stories high, and he'd sit atop these perched on the edge while many people would look on in wonder and amazement. This is that young man there, I can't pronounce his name, Wu Young Ning, I think it is. Anyway, he became very well known for doing these types of stunts, and you could see he's even holding in his hand a, a camera, and he would put his stunts on social media to do this. Um, he had a large following in his country. Uh, he was planning to get married, and his fiance had convinced him to give up doing these stunts. At the same time, there was a promotional contest that was going on that would pay him quite a sum of money. Uh, to do a stunt to climb another building. So uh, he decided to do this one last stunt so that he could collect the money for his planned wedding. The money was never collected. As he neared the top of this building, he lost his grip and he fell more than 60 stories to his death in front of many onlookers. The decision that he made to climb this building one more time was one that he could never take back and it changed the lives of his family, his friends and his fiance forever. Now almost everybody I know would say that he was foolish to gamble with his life in this way and he paid the ultimate price. But the question is, how many people today are taking a far greater risk of losing eternal life than they realize by the decisions that they make to follow an unsafe and an unsound course, ignoring the danger signs around them? We want to explore that in more detail today. So the scripture text, as we said, is, and take heed to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. When we look closely at this text, there are some interesting words that are used here in this text. Surfeiting means overindulgence, excess gluttony, and drunkenness. And in the Greek, it means intoxication. Uh, the cares of this life means the worries and the anxieties or the concerns of this life. And the warning is against overindulging and becoming intoxicated with the cares of this life, 
lest we become ensnared. And a sneer is like a noose-like trap. This is an old sneer that you can see here that they used to use. And this is one recently. It, they use it to catch different types of animals. And it's easy for us to walk into a trap and become sneered like an animal when we are careless about the decisions that we make in life. We fail to see the dangers sometimes that are right in front of us. So we have to exercise our spiritual eyesight to see these dangers. And it's only the Holy Spirit that gives us spiritual eyesight. But there are some things that we need to do to obtain this eyesight. Satan thrives on causing Christians to doubt. Uh, he is constantly looking to shake our faith in Christ so that he can win us over to his side. Uh, it's doubt that leads to unbelief, and it's unbelief is the reason that many in these last days will reject the saving truths that are essential for our salvation. This is Steps to Christ, page 107. God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. His existence, his character, the truthfulness of his word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. And notice this, it says, God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. Turn with me to Hebrews 11.1. And I have it up on the screen. Many of you probably know it by heart. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. So doubt is the exact opposite of faith. It is faith that allows us to see the spiritual things that God wants to reveal to us through His Holy Spirit. Uh, turn over to 1 Corinthians. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 12 to 16. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 16, and just let me know when you're there by saying amen. amen. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are what? They're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So God has given us plenty of evidence in the scriptures of his divine character, and we should never doubt his word because we cannot understand all the mysteries that are hidden in the pages. The reason why so many professed Christians and even highly educated theologians misinterpret the scriptures and they come to the wrong conclusions is because of doubt and because of skepticism. They're open to the truth only as long as it agrees with their own preconceived ideas and their own preconceived opinions. And as a result, they twist the scriptures unto their own destruction. Let's look at that, 2 Peter 3, 16 and 17. Let's read that, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, 
as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware ye also, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. So why do so many of God's professed people today profess Christians misinterpret and twist the scriptures? Well, the answer is really quite simple, yet it is still a mystery to many people. There's only one way that we can ever come to the right conclusions when we study the Bible, and that is to allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And the only way that the Holy Spirit can be our teacher is to put away all pride and all self-sufficiency and to humble ourselves like a little child. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals the deep things of God. And the Holy Spirit can only work on our hearts to reveal these things if we humble ourselves. We, can't, we have to put away all pride and all self-sufficiency. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 2 and let's read verse 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and we'll read verse 10 and 11. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So, beloved, this text here tells us clearly that only the Spirit of God can reveal the things of God. Man cannot do it on his own. It's only God that can reveal his character to us. And if we are not led by the Holy Spirit when we study the Bible, then we will come to the wrong conclusions. And it doesn't matter how educated we are or how learned we think we are. It is only the Holy Spirit that guides us into all truth. Does that make sense? Turn in your Bibles to John, and let's look at chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. John, chapter 16, and verses 13 and 14. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. So our hearts must be open to the truth if we want the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. So we must not only have a love for the truth, which is is a sincere desire to know the truth, but we have to have a willingness of heart to obey the truth once it is revealed to us. So there's two parts to it. We can do this by faith if we put away all our pride and we become like little children ready to learn at the feet of Jesus. You know how you have that have children, how trusting they are of their parents and we have to be like little children and trust our heavenly parents, our heavenly Father in heaven. Uh, this is Steps to Christ, page 110. It says, if we would not have the scriptures clouded to our understanding so that the plainest truth shall not be comprehended, we must have the simplicity and faith of a little child, ready to learn and beseeching the aid of the Holy Spirit. A sense of the power and wisdom of God and of our inability to comprehend His greatness should inspire us with what? Humility. It should inspire us with humility and we should open His word as we would enter into His presence with holy awe. And that's what it means to come with a humble spirit to learn the truths that He wants to teach us. John 717 says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So doubt and skepticism are the real enemy of truth. 
the spirit of prophecy tells us that the real cause of doubt and skepticism in most cases is the love of sin. The teachings and restrictions of God's word are not welcome to the proud sin loving heart. And you remember that even though Judas heard the words of truth from the greatest teacher that ever lived in this world, which is Jesus Christ, it had no effect on him because he closed his heart to it. He was proud and he was covetous, so he refused to humble himself. The Spirit of God could not convict him of truth because he wasn't open to it. It doesn't matter if they're hearing the words of Jesus Christ and they're sitting right there in front of him, your heart still has to be open to the truth in order to receive it. Uh, Judas's, his, Judas' pride and his self-sufficiency, it separated him from Christ and the other disciples. I mean, he knew, just like the other disciples, that Jesus was truly the Messiah, but his love for sin and the riches of this world was greater than his love for Christ, and as a result, he'll be eternally lost. Oh, beloved, how many of us today are following in his faithful steps today, never realizing their danger? Another unsafe course that people take is to delay. Uh, people will delay heeding the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the danger here cannot be overestimated. I remember the story that one pastor told me of a man that he once knew that had left the church. And this man got involved in a variety of ungodly activities and he was fast going down a worldly path to perdition. Uh, sometime later, they had a crusade at the church that was being held at the local church and the pastor remembered him and he reached out to this young man to encourage him to come and attend this crusade. Uh, he invited him or spoke to him a couple different times to invite him to come back to the church and study. And each time the man kept saying that he was not ready to come back, but that later he would consider it. Well, a short time later, this man was walking down the road and uh, he was walking down the side of the highway and a car veered off the side of the road and killed him. He was killed instantly. He never realized that the invitation the pastor gave him would be the last chance that he would ever have to accept Christ as the Lord of his life. How many of us are taking that same gamble with eternal life or eternal loss today? The question is, can any of us afford to take that chance, to take that risk? Who knows whether the invitation that God gives us, the invitation that we receive, is going to be our last chance to accept salvation that is so freely offered to all of us. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and let us look, read verse 1 and 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. For he saith, I have, we, I'm sorry, we then as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Beloved, now is the day of salvation because tomorrow may be too late. None of us here is guaranteed another day on this earth. And we cannot afford to ignore the promptings of the Holy Spirit. This is manuscript 40. There are many feeding upon chaff who need to search the scriptures for themselves that they may see their lives as they appear to God, full of lightness and trifling. If these self-deceived souls could be made aware of their real ignorance, and could see the love of God and the relation in which they stand toward him, they would not close their eyes and sleep till they stood before the mercy seat, pleading for pardon before it is too late. When? Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. 
There are but few sands in the hour of glass of time. Patience and mercy have alike been presumed upon, and if sinners would break the snare of Satan, they must lose no time. We're all familiar with the story, the Bible stories of Felix and King Agrippa. You know, their stories are very sobering. When Paul reasoned with Felix about the righteousness and judgment, the governor trembled and he promised to call for Paul when he had a more convenient season. But that better time never came and Felix went down into a Christless grave. Remember King Agrippa, he was deeply moved. He was deeply convicted as he listened to Paul's testimony about Christ. And he cried out, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What a tragedy that neither of these Roman rulers moved to obey what they knew to be right. Almost is not enough. Their stories are recorded in scriptures as a sobering warning to us not to linger over the call. They waited too long until their conviction it disappeared. I read something. This is from the book Last Night on Earth by Joe Cruz in the chapter called Lingering Over the Call. It's one of my favorite witnessing books. And I'm quoting. It says, Men and women today do the same things. They wait for more convenient circumstances a different job, retirement, or financial security. They make promises to themselves and others that they will surrender to Christ and obey the truth just as soon as the time is right. Satan hears these promises and he immediately begins to manipulate events that will make that right moment impossible. Those people keep waiting and waiting and waiting and many of them will be waiting when the water turns to blood and probation's door has closed on the human race end quote oh friends how often do we hear these warnings of impending doom that are sure to come upon this wicked world yet many christians who know better act as if they have all the time in the world to get ready and one day, sooner than many of us realize, it will all be over. It'll be too late for those that have waited too long. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's read verses 1 to 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, Ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that in the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Friends, we need to watch and be sober. We must be wide awake to the devil's sneers and the devil's temptations. Our only safety is to put our whole faith and trust in God's word and to submit our wills to him so that we can fully reflect his character. Turn in your Bibles to Mark 13, and we're going to read verse 33 to 37. Mark 13, 33 to 37. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, 
lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Will we heed the Savior's admonition to us to watch? Or will we be found sleeping when the door of probation closes? This is desire of ages. Everything in the world is in agitation. The signs of the time are ominous. Coming events cast their shadows before. The Spirit of God is withdrawing from the earth and calamity follows calamity by sea and by land. There are tempests, earthquakes, fires, floods, murders of every grade. Who can read the future? Where is security? And notice these words. There is assurance in nothing but that is human or earthly. Rapidly are men ranging themselves under the banner they have chosen. Restlessly are they waiting and watching the movements of their leaders. There are those who are waiting and watching for our Lord's appearance. But notice it says another class are falling into line under the generalship of the first great apostate. Few believe with heart and soul that we have a hell to shun and a heaven to win. The crisis is steadily, gradually, is stealing gradually upon us. Oh, what sobering words these are, brothers and sisters. Are we waiting and are we watching and working for the Lord's appearing? Or are we simply biding our time thinking that we have more time than we really have to get ready? What is another way that people take an unsafe course today? A course that could surely lead to their destruction. It's through the sin of unbelief. I'm sure almost all of us have heard the popular saying that, well, I'll believe it when I see it. We call these people doubting Thomases. Now, we remember his story all too well, don't we? When the disciples were immediately gathered with Jesus after the crucifixion, Thomas wasn't with them. Uh, he refused to believe the reports of the other disciples. And the next time they met and Jesus appeared, and Thomas was there. So let's pick up the story there. Let's turn to John 20, 24 to 29. John chapter 20, and we're going to read verse 24 to 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. So the Lord gently rebuked Thomas for his unbelief. And this is the same dangerous course that many Christians take today. God says to go forward in faith, and I'll open the way. But these types of people say, open the way for first, and then I'll go forward. This is the exact opposite of faith, friends. It is the sin of unbelief that plagues many of profess, God's professed people today. And it was unbelief that caused the children of Israel to perish in the wilderness. Only two of the vast multitude, perhaps a million or more that had left Egypt, entered into Canaan. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3, 
And let's read verse 12 to 19. Hebrews 3, 12 to 19. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So it was unbelief that was the ruin of the children of Israel and left many of their carcasses strewn in the wilderness. And it is unbelief that is going to be the ruin of many of God's people today. It's imperative that we realize the danger of unbelief. And who is the father of unbelief? It is Satan. This is Confrontation 23. It says, Satan is the parent of unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion. He filled Cain with doubt and with madness against his innocent brother and against God because his sacrifice was refused and Abel's was accepted. And he slew his brother in his insane madness. Friends, too many today are wandering down the dangerous path of unbelief, unaware of their danger. They seem oblivious to it. They think that they are safe in their presumptuous sins. And the angels of God weep over their carelessness and are alarmed at their spiritual condition. Listen to this sobering statement. Testimony for the church says the unbelief pride, covetousness, and love of the world, which have existed in the hearts of God's professed people, have grieved the sinless angels. The grievous and presumptuous sins which exist in the hearts of many have caused angels to weep as they have seen that God has been dishonored because of the inconsistent, crooked course of professed followers of Christ. And yet those the most at fault, those who cause the greatest feebleness in the church and bring upon their holy profession a stain, do not seem to be alarmed or convicted, but seem to feel that they are flourishing in the Lord. This is a case of self-deception, and we don't want to be caught there. Testimony continued. It says many believe themselves to be on the right foundation, that they have the truth, and rejoice in the clearness of truth, and boast of the powerful arguments in proof of the correctness of our position, and reckon themselves among the chosen peculiar people of God, yet they experience not his presence and power to save them from yielding to temptation and folly. They profess to know God yet in works deny him how great is their darkness the love of the world with many the deceitfulness of riches with others has choked the word and they have become unfruitful end quote this statement from the pen of inspiration is really a wake-up call to all of us that profess christ to do a thorough self-examination we cannot afford to take the wrong course or an unsafe path or it could spell disaster for us. We must rely on the Lord to guide us by strict obedience to his word and anything less is unacceptable to God. We have to have the spiritual eyesight to discern the snares of Satan and it's only by the Holy Spirit that we can take a safe course 
The final exam is almost upon us. Almost doesn't make it. If we almost pass, it means that we failed. We must pass. Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 2, and let's read verse 8 to 13. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall, shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. To deliver thee from the way of evil men, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Beloved, it is God who preserves us. And it is God that gives us wisdom and gives us understanding. It is God that guides us in the path of righteousness. All we need to do is to have a willing heart and faith that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice this from Conflict and Courage. The only safe course is to let our prayers go forth daily from a sincere heart, as did David. Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. So we have to use every particle of energy that we have and clear foresight in order to discern the wiles of the devil. Our only safety is to walk humbly before the Lord and to trust him. Turn to Proverbs 3 and we'll read verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Oh, if only we would do this, God will direct us in everything that we do. We would never fall. The counsel, this counsel would prevent many of us who are stumbling along the path and are falling off the path into darkness and into the darkness of confusion and error. It would save us if we would heed this counsel. The only safe course is to follow the light that God permits to shine on all of us and if we neglect to do this, that light then becomes darkness. So it's when we become wise in our own eyes that we then endanger ourselves and become foolish. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 20. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. So it's when we trust to our own wisdom is when we are sure to fall. What's wrong becomes right in our own sight and then what's right becomes wrong. So Satan blinds our eyes to the plain truth because we trusted in the arm of flesh. So when we rely on our own wisdom, it is an unsafe course. It's only going to lead us to ruin. We have to rely strictly and solely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Because today in this day and age, many bright lights in Adventism are going out. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 5, and let's read verse 20 and 21. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And when we become wise in our own eyes, then we can picture this lion like Satan attacking us because that's what we do. We put ourselves in Satan's presence when we become wise in our own eyes. We have to become wise in the Lord. And this warning is for all of us that is living at the end of time. You know, Satan doesn't want us to rely on God for wisdom, so 
He appeals to our pride and our vanity, uh, but we can't fall for it, friends. He knows that once we do this, then he will easily separate us from Christ, and that is Satan's goal. Signs of the times says, Many profess to be wise, but, they, but have they the Holy Spirit? As a people, we profess to know the truth, but of what avail will be, this be if we do not carry out its principles in our life? How many say, oh yes, the coming of Christ is at the door. The end is so near that there is no time to carry the message to those who sit in darkness. There's no need of spending money on foreign work, for the end will come before it will be accomplished. Is this the way that you carry out the injunction of your coming Lord to preach the gospel in all the world for a witness to all nations? It is your business to be ready for the coming of the Lord and you cannot be ready while failing to carry out his commands. End quote. Beloved, the only safe course that any of us has today is to carry out the command of God with strict obedience and integrity and faithfulness. I believe that no one of us here wants to be lost traveling down an unsafe course. We want to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Let us put our faith into action. Let us be found faithful to our trust. Let us rely solely on God because his promises are sure. Let us never doubt and distrust his word. Let us never be found committing the sin of unbelief. Let us put away our pride and humble ourselves before the Lord. Let us take the only safe course that we have, the only safe course that's going to lead us through to the kingdom of God. This course is Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer. It is only through our love and obedience to Him that we will be ready to meet the trials that are sure to come upon us and that we will not be overcome by these trials. It is through Jesus Christ that we will gain the victory over sin. And soon we all want to hear the words that we long to hear. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of this world. I want to hear those words, and I know everyone here wants to hear those words. We have to answer the call of Christ, and Christ is calling us all to be faithful witnesses for him, to represent him to a world that many people are now going to Christless graves. I would like to invite all of those that want to hear these same beautiful words to please come to the front and to please join me in a special prayer of dedication. Our Heavenly Father, You've bore long with us, Lord. You've shed your precious blood on the cross of Calvary to save each one of us. You will that not one of us will be lost. Lord, help us to accept your great sacrifice. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to our trust, to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. I pray for each and every one here, Lord. I pray that we will receive the blessing of your Holy Spirit and that we can be guided into all truth and righteousness. I pray that we will go and stand in the face of danger. You will strengthen us. You've promised to be with us. You've promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, we claim that promise today. And I claim that promise for each and every one here. I thank you, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen.